Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our last talk of this uh, International Colloquium of Philosophy in Synods. Uh, it's um, my pleasure to introduce you, Professor Michael Logan, who was here, I think, five years ago. So many of you may know him, his work. But for those who don't know, Professor uh, Michael Logan uh, works with applied philosophy in the School of Biomedical Sciences at the University of West London. There he did also a master degree in person-centered health and social care. He's a, an academic visitor at the Nufil department and uh, works in, as a project director also uh, at the Collaborating Center for Values Based Practice, St. Catherine's College, Oxford. Uh, he published uh, many papers, uh, articles. In 2002, uh, he published a book, Ethics, Management, and Mythology. And in this, uh, to, this year, to 23, uh, he wrote this book. It's out. Uh, just out, <laughs> just came <laughs> out. Um, the title is The Philosophy of Person-Centered Healthcare. It, he co-authored with Derek Mitchell, and it is published by Cambridge Scholars Publishing. And some of the points I think he is going to mention today. Um, so I really recommend, I read this book. Marco, please read, it's good. I know that Marco has the book. Yeah. You need just, you just need to, you just need to read, okay? It's, it's, I recommend. <laughs> and today, uh, Professor Michael Logan is uh, talking about the artificial intelligence and personal-centered healthcare. Oh, Thank okay. you, Mike. Well, thanks for, um... I must say, it's a bit weird. I feel a bit weird sitting down. I'm used to, when I give talks, I normally pace up and down, you know, and then walk about, but I'll try, I'll try and sit in my seat properly. My apologies, anyway, obviously, but, you know, I can't say it's in Portuguese. I've got to do, give the talk in English. And I think that, that that's, I've, I've missed some of the sessions because of that. And I think there were some interesting ideas that have come out. So my apologies if I'm repeating anything people have said before. I don't think so, but I think this very much follows on from the ideas in the previous session. So thanks to the organisers, for involving me and uh, for inviting me. Can, is, it, is it okay? Yeah. yeah. Thanks to the organisers for inviting me. What's wrong? No, no, it's not. on. What's going on? It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. All right. Well, um, so I was saying, well, thanks for inviting me to uh, try and make it relevant to, you know, as you say, it was, it was your title is the philosophy of artificial intelligence, current and future, it seems. So um, I, I want to follow on from what particularly the two speakers in the previous session said. Um, and I, because I could see the links between what you were saying there and the debates I want to talk about in person-centered healthcare. So, and thank, and I also, I, I've got, and people can see this, I'll give, I'm happy if people want to have a copy of this um, PowerPoint. And I've got references at the end. Uh, but I'm also going to be referencing some of the materials, some of the quite interesting material that the conference organisers sent to us um, beforehand as well. And I think what I basically want to try and argue is that there are, yeah, you, you say in your, the stuff that you sent around, well, yes, this debate on, on artificial intelligence or AI is at early stages. I think, you know, there's base in person-centered healthcare. There's a sense in which it's a revival of a really ancient debate. You go back to Hippocrates and so forth. But there's all, but in terms of it's gaining attention, it's only really, apart from a few sort of disgruntled voices, it's only really gained serious attention in the last sort of 10 years or so. And suddenly the language of person-centered care is everywhere and in policy documents across the globe and so forth. Um, but it's still, that debate still seems to me to have a long way to go as well. Um, and so, and I'm, my feeling is, what I'll try to argue is that I think the two debates can throw light on each other in a certain respect. Um, they can help to illustrate each other because what the, the, they both draw our attention to certain underlying assumptions and certain underlying problems 
Um, but those problems are actually more obvious in the AI debate than they are in the person-centered healthcare debate. So AI can help throw light on the person-centered healthcare debate um, by drawing attention to something which I'll call the a certain notion of illusory objectivity, that when human beings, we create all manner of systems, not just technical systems, but also theoretical systems, problem-solving systems for all sorts of reasons, and yeah, for good reasons, but they can create a sense of illusory objectivity where we don't think that we need then, you know, they, to sort of think and interpret and critically evaluate those systems and their implications in real cases. And yet, in fact, we do. Now, a similar problem actually exists for a lot of the work in person-centered care and certain other things like bioethics and so forth. There's, there's, there's issues there that I'll try and refer to. And so I think the AI debate can help throw light on the problems for those debates. And, and the, I think the person-centered healthcare debate can also throw light on the proper use of AI and it by raising certain underlying assumptions about the relationship between science and scientific practice generally, of which AI is going to increasingly become a part in medical practice, um, on, on the one hand, and our intellectual and moral assumptions and our features that we were talking about in the last talk about our, a broader notion of our humanity and the fact that doctors, medics are people, are persons, and why that's actually important. Uh, and so it can get so the two debates can, it seems to me, help one can help illustrate the other. So I hope I managed to say that within the time because I've only got an hour. Or so, so, so does that make sense so far? Is that people can, yeah. Um, now, obviously, I think when the organizers first put to me to join, what's up? They yeah, were looking, okay. Yeah, <laughs> they were looking at, um, there were one thing they were looking for was sort of problems and tensions between the two because obviously, looking at it in a fairly simple way, you know, obviously, the. AI, artificial intelligence, it's about the machine. And then your know, person centered is about the person, you know, the, the caring the human side, and so forth. You, know, so you can imagine that there are tensions between them. And there, it, there can be. But obviously, a lot of what we've seen in this conference, it seems to me, people have talked about the benefits of AI in all sorts of areas, including to, you know, at psychology and diagnosing genuine human problems. Um, a machine learning and bit the uses of big data. Uh, and I think, you know, I mean, the influences for me, there's a very good paper, image-based diagnosis and screening by our wonderful Australian colleagues, Eves Aquino, Wendy Rogers, and, 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 and other authors, um, where they explain some of the uh, the ways in which I won't go, I won't go into that now because I don't have time. And anyway, I think the other sessions have explained the benefits and the people understand the benefits much better than I do. I'm actually very low tech. But I get a sense of why these you know, can be enormous help to practitioners. And in particular, the, the, the paper um, by uh, you know the, um, Martin Isler and colleagues, the cardiovascular colleagues, uh, the identification of hidden and complex patterns, how, you know, the huge number of things, it's just our human brains are too small to take on, you know, the, 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 that much data and to find patterns over a long period. And that can obviously be hugely helpful. But what the conference organizers said and the information they sent to us as speakers, they talked about bringing in algorithms to remove uh, cognitive biases or noise to make for more logical or rational decisions and, you know, to avoid partiality and discrimination. Thus, I think they put that this could it could do this theoretically because they were already aware and they made points themselves about how you know how limited that actually is and what the problems for that are. Um, and it came out in some of them came out the previous talk, so I will go over them. But obviously there are intuitive conflicts with conflicts with person-centered healthcare. Because obviously, on the one hand, AI is all about mass data, whereas one of the things about person-centered care is the notion of uniqueness. You know, the idea that this individual patient can be different than you know, no matter how much evidence you've got for what this type of patient needs, you need to know the individual patient and what can be specific and distinctive about that person. So you're not just looking for regularities. But obviously there are, this raises certain underlying questions about um, when distinctiveness is relevant and what kind of epistemic and moral virtues we need to cultivate in order to recognize that because there is you know such a thing as bias there can be you sometimes your, your intuitions can be wrong so we, we need to have a debate about that but you know but what we don't want to do though is somehow try to sideline that debate and say no we're just going to turn it all over to artificial intelligence because that's more objective in some sense no, you know, no it isn't but 
So there are people, writers and peasants in the care who would no doubt regard AI-guided practice as depersonalised. So one of the big complaints over the last century, which led to you know, certain authors wanting to get the person-centred movement started, was the claim that medicine become more personal, depersonalised. So Marco talks about his patients are loving him. Well, uh, you know, but you know, obviously the idea is a lot of you know, the idea is a lot of doctors would encourage to actually be more depersonalised. And certainly, there's that wonderful paper by that the Canadian author Stephen Henry, where in terms of his other faculties besides his purely scientific knowledge, he had he talked about his, his using his normal human capacities as his dark secrets. He, he he wouldn't write up in his decision making. He'd make it sound very scientific and evidence based in his decision as to why he diagnosed this patient with this, and pretend he hadn't used these other intuitive faculties that he has. Um, so now I so said we, Marco. I so said, I thought you published that paper. I've got down the reference for that there, but you know the, the real, which you were talking about in the previous one, the real doctor versus chatbot. So I, I want to talk about that. Um, I tend to agree with you as to why we would have a real doctor other than the chatbot. I want to sort of, but I wanted to hopefully to try and expand on that point. Um, in the information that the conference organisers sent out, and I noticed this was taken off by our previous speaker, Muriel, wasn't it? Um, she talked about, she actually explicitly mentions that, you know, Spotify, Netflix and YouTube. And the point is, what you were saying there was individual, you know, we seem happy enough to use AI um, to guide individual preferences, but we're more nervous when it comes to complex moral judgments. Now, because the point is, and this came back, this something which came up in your speech, the one that she said, oh, these things could help you get more personal knowledge. Well, I have to say, you know, she, I, I was a bit, uh, yeah, their recommendations can tell you something about yourself. Well, I, did, I hope that's false in my case. I actually want to take up, you know, YouTube. I mean, they do make judgments about you. They have some sort of underlying intellectual framework, clearly. So an incident that happened to me not that long ago with YouTube, you know, it has your recommendations and they recommend certain videos to it, right? So I... I had looked at, I've been watching for some, what was it now? Um, there was a clip from the film Cabaret. Do you know the film Cabaret? It's set in pre-war Germany, it's a musical, and it's about, um, it's about these, this very sort of, you know, this sort of very gay troupe of people who, you know, and they're living at the wrong time because they're living in 1930s Germany. And they're going to be threatening. <laughs> There's like Jew Jewish people, gay people. There's also people there who are going to be victims of fascism. And some there's a scene in it where there's this, and it brings out it. It it, it gives the main character a reason to realise just how strong and disturbing the Nazi movement is at this point, because there's a little Nazi band playing, and they're doing that song, "Do Far the, the, the Fatherland." What it was it? Uh, Tomorrow belongs to me. Do we not? Do we, know, do we know this song? I mean, well, good on you, I suppose, if you don't, in a way. But you know, oh, well, sure. I, no, I won't sing it because I'm being recorded. Yeah, that that would be great. That would just get. That would be great if that came up on, yeah, you know, <laughs> British feed somewhere. You know, UK academic sings fascist revival song at conference in, uh, in Brazil. So I, I will avoid singing the song. But basically, they start playing this song, Fatherland, and of course, all the crowd and everyone in the park starts joining in, and the whole park is singing, you know, tomorrow. Back on you know, and it's like I said, I went behind, I've only seen, you know, yeah, that's another, yes, man makes gesture, but you know, I'll, I'll avoid the gesture as well. But um, basically, um, I watched that because various reasons I watched that, someone talked to me about that film, which reminded me of it. But I also, I'm a, I'm a member of an anti fascist group called Hope Not Hate, and Hope Not Hate has sent me links to certain videos with quite high up figures, British politicians addressing far right groups. And so I'd watch those, and they were saying, look at this, this is worrying. This guy has all this power, and here he is. And look at the people in the crowd who are cheering on what he's saying, and just listen to what he's saying, for heaven's sake. It's scary. And I'm like, and I was, so I watched those videos. Anyway, next thing, YouTube, recommended for you, right? What's recommended for me? I, I, I don't, again, I make you, no reason why you should know it. The Black and White Minstrel Show, has any of you ever heard of this? A show in the 1970s Britain, in which white guys blacked up their faces, put black on their faces, and I won't do the songs because, again, you know, it could be seen as, you know, actually be broadcast as you know, a British man to, trying to revive the black and white minstrel show. It was actually banned in the 1970s by the British Broadcasting Corporation for racism. 
amazing in the 1970s when you think race was like everywhere in Britain, you know it was just, and yet it, this was considered too racist then because it's did white guys doing these hilarious funny negro impressions and doing, singing these little songs and it now that was recommended to me on youtube after i put after i'd watched the whole night hate and they right what's their judgment about me that's fairly clear there's a question you're a fascist basically right you'll probably like this racist video Right, they will send you some 1970s racist comedians. They did send me a recommendation to the far right 1980s far right band Screwdriver. Have a look, have a look at that. So they pulled a conclusion on me that I'm a fascist. Now they, they basically they're not moralistic about it in the sense, and this is they do have, but there's an underlying ethos. They don't say, Michael, we're worried about you. Why are you looking at this fascist stuff? No, what you their their underlying ethos, which I do think there's an ethic that YouTube has, which is crude consumerism, isn't it? You to, well, sir, we've noticed you like these we, these these videos. We think this means you're a fascist, so you don't, don't like this racist comedy show with these people mocking black people in it. Would you like that, sir? You know, there's no actual. You know, so they make judgments, and all AI makes judgments. And you know, I would like to say they get it wrong about me. And you know, she was saying, I don't think I learned something about me as a person. But that's why I would disagree with the previous speaker <laughs> when she said that. <laughs> but they get it wrong. But the point is. Um, We certainly then should be doubtful when it comes to more complex moral judgments that they're, you know, and using this to assist us. And that's one of the points that they're making. And the, the, the organisers put in decisions in re risky circumstances and, you know, the distinction between um, algorithms and human reasoning and dialogue. And we have to be careful about thinking that the algorithms can solve the problems for us. But nonetheless, people thought they could. And people have used them. And indeed, the previous speaker, she made reference to one which was this, you know, in the, it was using nice estates, law, sentencing and parole, the compass, what was it, correctional offender management profiling for alternative sanctions. And she said, deciding when you give people more serious uh, sentences and longer sentences, um, and the idea was it would be, it would be a way to reduce uh, recidivism, reoffending, but in actual fact, Research indicates that it has led to unfair, racist discrimination. Just like you know, in other parts, you know, when the humans make the decisions in, in, in the United States, the black guy gets longer than the white guy. Guess what? The high tech solution has the same patterns to it. Mm -hmm. um, now, the organisers also talked about war and you know, thing like lethal weapons and targeting and using you know, the dangers in using AI to predict that. Um, no more dangerous, it seems to me, than using human politicians to make those decisions. When you look at you know, some of the things that we've, some of the horrendous decisions that we've seen, uh, well, for a long time now, but recently, I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, accident reduction, uh, they, they talked about autonomous cars making decisions. You know, the, uh, the problems with that in terms of what, this, what their basis is for their decisions in terms of when they swerve to avoid something and who they're protecting and how many people. Wasn't that the example? Did you? I did. Would you have a, put that in the notes? Because it wasn't that the old Isaac Asimov, you know, the Isaac Asimov's I Robot series, wasn't that? I said I was a boy when I read it, but so I might be getting this wrong. But wasn't that the reason why? The, was it Detective Elijah Bailey? Wasn't it his hatred for the robots came from the fact that when he was younger, he was in some kind of car accident and it plunged into the car, plunged into the water, and there was him and a child, and the robot came in. And of course, the robot calculated it had 85% chance of saving the life of Elijah and a 40% chance of saving the life of the child. So it pulled Elijah out. And he's saying, he's saying, save the child, save the child. And it's pulling him to save you. You must hold your breath now, sir. Right? <laughs> and um, he, 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 it made him feel he shouldn't be alive. And he, he resented the robots as a result of that. But you, know, you can see there are problems. But that raises interesting questions about our own views on ethics and how we make decisions and what kind of intuitions are relevant and can we give any systematic account of that and you know the similar point here you know, the organ donation and transplantation now i think anyone i don't know people's background here but anyone who's taught ethics and applied ethics you will know the difficulties of applying any theoretical system to these questions right you can't just say like oh for your lethal weapons one just war theory right Let's use just, and that's developed too from very credible sources. The double effects doctrine, Thomas Aquinas has got a role in this. And yeah, you. The point is, 
How that works in practice, well, we see, and we see the debate now, although it's, like, it's not like the only time we've heard it, right? Political leaders saying it is entirely legitimate for us to bomb a hospital, knowing that we will kill many, many children in that attack, because, according to just war theory, they're not the intended target. They are unfortunate and deeply distressing side effects of our action, which is to take out the enemy. Take out the earth and to take out the, the combatants on the other side. Now we've seen that justification used again and again. But you know, the point is with all of these issues, you can't just have, whether it's an AI system or any other system which humans have invented, including theoretical systems, you have to continually critique the system. That's what you have to think, you know, sometimes its outcomes can give us reasons to think, okay, if that's where this has led us, credible as it sounds at first. Do we need to now go back? You know, so when you're teaching, you don't just teach people, here's the right system. The trouble is, of course, in certain areas you do. And, you know, the, you know this is where some of the dangers, not just for AI, but for other types of, you know, where you will, you, know, you will tell some practitioners, no, here's the policy, you just follow that. You just get on with it and put aside any worries of conscience you have. And at some point, you know, in some cases, people will actually give up their jobs rather than take certain decisions because they, they, they find that they just can't ethically do it. So there are deep-seated problems, um, and AI can help illustrate those problems, but I don't think it's the origin of the problem at all. Um, and so we need to distinguish AI from certain types of theorizing about AI. Now, I don't know, that, how, are these terms familiar? Transhumanism and anti-technology? This idea that we can move, you know, so these things, I'm going to put up the, that we can move beyond our humanity, and that humans as they are are somehow inferior and there's, you know, and some of the links, some of the people that have written in this have been quite sympathetic to eugenics and so forth, haven't they? You know, so, but the, and then on the other side, the anti technology, the guy whose name I can never pronounce right. What's it? What's he called? Um, K uh, Kaczynski, is it? I'm not sure. But the guy who was who turned out to be the Unibomber, who basically again saw technology and particularly things like AI in particular, but other types of technology as destructive to our humanity. Now, what these two theories seem to have in common is a shared assumption of what our humanity is. And the idea that technology is some, you know, somehow in conflict with it. But one side just thinks it's, it's wonderful because the sooner we get rid of our humanity, the better. Whereas the other side says, no, we must fight to the death and indeed murder people on aeroplanes in order to uh, get rid of the technology. Now, I'm not going to be going with either of those positions. It seems to me AI in and of itself is neither pro nor anti person centered healthcare, um, but rather. There are underlying problems and limitations for our problem-solving systems, and AI is just a useful way, say, to, to draw attention to them. But that we need, at some point, to com to confront those broader problems, and then go back to AI and see where it fits into what we've got. Um, so, as we've seen, I'm at risk of I hope I'm not sort of overstating the point here. But, uh, big data gives rise to patterns, and that shows, you know, the search is for relevant similarities. And obviously, relevance implies an underlying conceptual and evaluative framework, which can, in principle, be criticised. So, obviously, we have a decision technology, is it replacing or enhancing human reasoning, evaluation, decision making? Well, I think for most of us, other than the two theories, I put the transhumans and the, and the Unabomber theory, most of us would want to say it's not replacing human reasoning, it's somehow enhancing or supporting it in some sense. That seems to me, you know, and in that sense, it's like many of the other sort of theoretical systems that we talked about. So, you know, the, the, we do, we have difficult lives and we have difficult things, so we will devise systems to try and help us make sense of the world. But we need to be, have a fallibilist view about them. I think you mentioned fallibilism in your talk, you know, we, have, we need to have a fallibilist view about them. The systems cannot replace individual human reasoning. Um, and so, as Aquino and colleagues make the point very nicely, Aquino said, AI relies on data generated, collected, and recorded by humans. So, when you're looking at clinical practice, of course, there are social, clinical, and cognitive biases, such as confirmation bias, that, you know, we need to be aware of, and that practitioners need to think about, and that won't and be a bit self-critical and reflective. But, they, as Aquino and Co. point out, there is such a thing as al algorithmic bias as well, that these above biases, because humans ultimately are creators of AI, 
AI can embed, can you know, its, its algorithms can just embed those biases. And we, I think we've seen that with things like the, you know, the, the compass system that I talked about before, quite clearly the same, whatever discriminate, and you know, the, Muriel had lots of other examples, didn't she, of that? Whatever discriminatory factors are there in human thinking anyway, can easily get built into the systems that they devise to, to, to assist them. So they don't, in fact, necessarily remove the bias, mm. or if they do, it's something that you have to think about. And again, I don't know, you know, Mark, could you produce, you know, produce a machine that was deeply self-critical, <laughs> a machine that had paranoid attacks and deep skepticism, like I don't think, oh my God, am I right? Or wrong, you know. Maybe if you could do, you'd be closer to getting the commander data figure then. But we—that's not what we've got in any sort of real-world uh, situation. So, as I sort of indicated at the beginning, what this draws our attention to is a certain type of illusory objectivity. And I don't want to be. You know, I don't. I certainly. I'm not so. I don't want to take a postmodernist line of being anti-objectivity as such. I'm just saying that we have to be careful as to what objectivity is. And part of you know, a lot of the stuff I've written and you, you sort of advertise he advertised my book before, didn't he? I suppose I was just stand there and go, mm -hmm. <laughs> advertise this here. I say you know, the book on persons, the philosophy of person centered healthcare. One of the things that I'm trying to argue there is there are certain dichotomies that we need to break down. And the object subject dichotomy is a key one. I thought that came in Muriel's speech as well. You know that we you know we, there, there's all sorts of use of the term objectivity that we so need not in science and indeed in ethics. Objectivity in terms of being able to put yourself in the position of others is absolutely crucial for ethics. And you don't have any empathy if you can't do that, if you can't see something from the other person's point of view. Um, so, But nonetheless, there's an illusory notion of objectivity as if a system in itself independent of human judgment can just tell us what we ought to do. And, we, and, we, and then, you know, and it's very, very tempting because life is so hard and you have to make so many, you know, in certain jobs, particularly if you are dealing in areas where you make decisions about organ transplantation, you've got to make some horrendous decisions. And sometimes you want to say, can't we just have a system that does that for me and takes away this, you know, why should I feel guilty about this? You know, in the sense in which you, you, know, you have to think it through, you shouldn't feel guilty if, if, the system, if the world has given you a horrible decision and you just have to try and figure out which is the least horrible thing to do. You're not a bad person as a result of that, you know, but, but nonetheless, it can make you know, just like Elijah Bailey, you can feel guilty about the very fact that you went through that experience, you know. Um, but we have to watch out, you know, that for the, the system, you know, that the system application gap and to think about how exactly we bridge that gap and not just to think you just automatically follow whatever your system says once you've verified that it's a proper system. And indeed, that it's endorsed by intellectuals because a lot of the stuff I wrote in ethics, a lot of the, I was saying that we have to watch ourselves. People in areas, certain areas of applied philosophy marketing themselves as top-level ethicists who then advise policy organisations on the, on the principles they should use, then the policy organization's managers try and apply those principles. And when the staff complain, they're told, shut up. This policy has been endorsed by some of the leading ethical experts in the land. Oh. And you can end up playing a political role that you did. You thought you were trying to be helpful, but you can play a political role in giving those in power. This is one of the things I was arguing ethics management and mythology. You know, so you know, you, you could, your work can become another stick in the already uh, powerful hand, you know, in the already sort of well-armed, <laughs> what is it, hands of the powerful, you know. Um, so there are analogies with theoretical systems used in bioethics, evidence-based practice, uh, person -centered, and indeed person-centred healthcare. Now, I've tried to make these points in other articles over the years. I've had debates with bioethicists about this, and there's a particular example of a quite recent one, which, you know, if I don't manage to sort of talk about this now, so, you know, people want to quiz me on this, then I'll try and remember to raise it. But um, there was also a wonderful, I meant to put in the, in the reading with, uh, with evidence-based practice, a wonderful paper by Kirsten Borgerson from 2009. So why reading the title isn't good enough, an evaluation of the 4S application, uh, approach to evidence-based medicine. Now, I think 
some of us were seen as en enemies of evidence-based medicine because we were crit but what we were critiquing the use it was put to. It was a very simplistic because again, you want to sell your your theories to policymakers, so you make something sounds if it's simplistic. Take it. So what was it? What was the wonderful thing they used about? Um, basically, so busy. You, you, they were it was like they were selling a product. Authors and evidence-based medicine. They write things like, well, busy practitioners haven't got their time to think through all of these complicated things, and we've got a nice system here that you can use. With these poor, there was it systems, synopsis, synthesis, studies, and you could use this system and you can apply it and you can very quickly get your decision about this particular case in terms of, you know, but which have to be, you know. And the point is, there are all sorts of good uses for the ideas and you know, systems put forward by defenders of, of evidence based practice, but the idea that they can replace uh, or, you know, give us you know, busy practitioners some time off isn't actually. You know, that, that, that's selling something in a misleading way. And similarly, it's interesting now, even person-centred healthcare with its, you know, you, you're supposed to be, it's, it's so human and caring and all the rest of it, right? I have already been told by one senior defender of person-centred healthcare that we should need, now that the terminology and the language of person-centred healthcare has been incorporated into so many policy documents and government documents, and in Britain, the NHS long-term plan enshrines it, We've been told we should stop theorising about person-centred care now and just tell practitioners to get on with it, right? Mm -hmm. End the critical discussion. So it becomes then another set of principles, which are just, you know, are you being person-centred? Oh, if you are, then you're doing well, well done. And you, as if you don't, you're not going to be faced with any difficult, horrible, contentious decisions anymore. You know? So all systems can be used in that way. And, you know, all we need to say, much as it's, kind of you know it's annoying and sometimes it's not i know sometimes it's not practical but where possible we need to continue to have critical dialogue including the examination of our underlying assumptions and conceptual frameworks and somehow we need to promote that and those of us who are educators whether we're health educators or educators in other areas we need to think about ways in which and it is difficult but we can help people to learn from each other and to realise that, you know, one of the things that I said in that, you know, the 2002 book, you know, history didn't end at just the point when we rolled up on the scene. We've inherited all sorts of frameworks, but we need to keep, keep thinking about them critically, because after all, if people had not done so in previous generations, we would not have had the understanding of the ideas that we have now. Um, and that we need to have options for the re-evaluation of our inventions. So... So about particularism versus bad faith. Now, that's actually the term particularism is it, it, Jonathan Dancy may, I think, initially use that phrase. But basically, the idea that we need to still be able to look at particular cases and see what would a virtuous person do in this case and sometimes be surprised that the systems which seem to us be really good systems seem to be telling us to do something which you know, seems unacceptable. And then with the, the, it's, it's difficult. We then have to think about why there's then contention. Am I just being prejudiced? Well, it seems unacceptable to me, or is it really unacceptable? How do we determine that? There are all sorts of questions that that raises, but what we can't do is pretend those questions don't exist. If we do that, then we have what Sartre called bad faith. We're then acting as if our decisions are somehow no longer our own responsibility. I think the important thing I want to make about, you know, that, that for Marcus took is that the notion of responsibility is absolutely crucial to all of this, and also things like our relational notion of personhood and so forth. So, um, Okay, so hopefully that's making sense so far. I'm not jabbering through it too incoherently, uh, but I'm just trying to make sure I get I get done within the time. Yeah. Um, so implications for the artificial intelligence person-centered healthcare relationship. Okay, um, well, one of the things that we're going to have to do, I think I'll try and explain more about this in a minute, but is reflect on fundamental assumptions of person-centered healthcare and their application. Uh, we'll be bringing up some of the points that Marco made in his talk about, you know, which he characterised, where was it now, in terms of the um, autonomy uh, view about in, in about bioethics and decision-making and its notion of person-centred care. Thus, um, there are reasons why we have to think about what exactly these this con this this position is all about and why why is it useful why do we need persons if we do need persons why and why is that is that a problem for artificial intelligence the relationship between person-centered care in particular and scientific reasoning in practice and ai is just a wonderful illustration 
of this issue, but it goes the issue goes deeper and, bro and broader than that, it seems to me. And the point of Mark made, the concept of the person as relational, because one of the issues of artificial intelligence is going to be say, until unless you do think that your chatbot is a, is a real person, you don't. We, we talked about this in the last session, but I'll say, you, know, you, can't, you don't want to enter into shared decision making and shared responsibility. And part of the thing about us as people is it is about dialogue. It's about engagement with others. And part of the thing that I'm trying to argue in that book is about being a person is about being in the real world and being involved with other people and the relations one has. And so we need to think about things like the role of trust. That was one thing when you were talking before in the other session, people were saying to you, like, what's missing? I, th I was hoping you'd come up with trust as one of the things, you know, and you were saying about what, what is it that the do real doctor has that the machine, do you can't really, you can't trust in the same way, unless it's another human being. When you really, you know, you can rely on machines in all sorts of ways, but that's not the same thing as trusting someone. And it has to be a someone that you trust. So these notions of trust, shared decision-making, and consi also considerations of broader social context in person-centered practice. And as we'll see, there are forms of person-centered care that don't actually emphasize them as much. And there's some that do. And I think we need to think about the ones that do if we're to understand what the issues are that are being generated by the AI debate and what its role and limitations can be. So again, hopefully that's clear enough so far. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Um, so, okay, so I will talk about two conceptions. My apologies to Dolly because I am repeating some material here, which I did <laughs> use in a, in a session with him. But, uh, basically, I'm looking at different conceptions of person-centered healthcare. Now, there might be, you might argue there are many conceptions, but I feel there are at least two, and these were influenced, you know, two broad conceptions that we've got that are dominant in the debate at the moment. And my wonderful ex-student, Stephen Town, unfortunately died a few years ago, was a big major figure in osteopathy in Britain. Um, Stephen wrote a paper in 2020 on person-centered care, and he identified two different conceptions. And you can see why both of them are taken seriously by what one of them is actually have more influence than the other, but he thinks the other one needs to be the one we emphasize. The reasons that I'll try and spell out. Um, so, on the one hand, person-centered healthcare can be seen as a humanitarian addition to good medicine, and there are all sorts of really good arguments as to why it's important to have this. So, things like patient compliance with decisions leading to better outcomes. Right? You know, if you you know, if you are a depersonalized medic, if you're someone that the, your patients don't love or trust, right? They're not going to follow your instructions. And more and more, we need self-management for all manner of conditions. And so the argument is you've wasted all of your money and all of your training and all of the, the, the if, if the patient, you know, the medication you prescribe, what have you, if the patient doesn't follow your advice. So the argument is that scientific reasoning, and that includes evidence-based practice and it includes artificial intelligence, scientific reasoning in clinical practice needs to be supplemented and that term supplemented comes in, if you look at some of the literature on evidence-based medicine in particular, the word supplement comes in a lot, uh, by greater recognition of patient choices. So you need to develop things like listening and communication skills. And that seems extremely reasonable. It's very hard to disagree. You know, we'd rather have a medic who can listen to us and communicate better with us than someone who can't. Um, but for various reasons that I'll go into, Timon prefers a more radical version and the basic idea here is scientific medicine, including, again, evidence-based practice and artificial intelligence, need to be subsumed within a broader humanistic account of clinical reasoning. This idea practitioners as persons. It's not just the patient who's the person. The practitioner is a person. And, that's, and the relationship that that makes possible is absolutely central to the future of a good practice. And the sort of thinking that you do as a practitioner your moral thinking, your broader social thinking, your engagement, your, the fact that you're an ordinary individual and a member of a society that includes the same people that you're dealing with, all of those things are important. The things that Stephen Henry said his dark secret was all about, that he had to keep out of his writing up of the decisions and make it sound like he, he was then purely an objective scientist when he made the decision. No, he wasn't. He was a person, and that's why he was a better doctor. You know, and doctors who can't have any intuitive <laughs> use those other faculties aren't 
as good very often at seeing what's wrong with the patient. So, okay, so this is where Derek and I, in our book that came out this year, we use Stephen's work and then we reference it clearly. You know, we dedicated the book to Stephen, actually. Um, but we use his work to develop those conceptions beyond the article that he wrote. Um, so the first form that he used, I've characterized as normal science plus. And that's actually a term that I've used when sitting with a colleague who was trying to explain to an organization why they needed to have more education on person centered care. And he want, and he was the only thing he was frightened of was the idea that, oh, we're, we're, we don't want to be seen as enemies of science. So he said, oh, no, this is what I call normal science plus, he said to the managers that he was selling this to. And that's interesting. And I like that expression. The idea that you need to integrate subjective or personal considerations into what is still a certain biomedical account of clinical reasoning. And again, if you know the literature on evidence-based medicine, this notion of integration is spelled out very clearly that basically you need to integrate these human factors. So it's, you know, in response to the criticisms of EBM, that it was giving you too simplistic. It was just saying, make these clinical decisions. What happens is people have moved it forward. And, they, and this is a move forward. This is a progression, clearly. Uh, and they said, uh, no, no, we need to integrate certain other factors, an understanding of, of patients and patienthood and their values and so forth. Um, This view, of course, has no fundamental, it can there's no fundamental philosophical challenge to what I call the modern worldview. Now, again, are we happy with the modern worldview? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, Descartes, post-Descartes, you know, Descartes characterised as the father of modern philosophy, for, for, and, you know, for not for bad reasons. His work wonderfully enshrines all sorts of features of the modern worldview. Now, then there are various critics of him. There's the rationalist empiricist debate, you know, people like David Hume, John Locke, you know, the people, Thomas Hobbes, various people that follow Descartes, but they all have a certain modern conception of the world. And again, I'm going to have to sketch it here. I can't go into too much uh, detail about it. But in the modern era, certain ideas were ruled in and certain things were put aside as part of ancient thinking or antiquity, and we sort of abandoned them altogether. And I think some of them we need to bring back. But basically, the modern worldview, the key features of it that are not being critiqued by this account of person centered care. And that's why it's sellable, because you know, you don't want to go, you don't want to go to a policymaker and say, oh, we're we're, we're really philosophically challenging things. You know, that's, they're not going to be interested in that. They just want to know, give us a system we can apply. Right. So we're not challenging things like science, the modern worldview of science, which is embodies a certain type of reductionism. Now, again, reductionism can be used in all sorts of ways. And I am very well aware, I don't want to be seen as a critic of reductionism in science generally, because reductionism as a methodology is incredibly important in certain scientific areas and has undoubtedly brought enormous progress in our understanding. But reductionism as a methodology can slip into reductionism as a philosophy only mm. too easily. And it's reductionism as a philosophy of science, which is a problem. So I don't know if you, there's a... Well, there's a book that illustrates this very nicely, right? We're all agreed, you know, except for those of us who are, you know, I don't know what the Unibomber thought, but those of us who are genuine, you know, all those who are not actually enemies of science, we're all agreed that things like neurology tells you an awful lot about human emotions. You study the human brain, you know, and if I didn't, if I wasn't capable of having certain types of brain states, there were certain things I couldn't feel, right? The, you, neurology can explain emotions in all sorts of ways. But we want to write a book called The Neurology of Emotions, Suppose instead, like an author called Griffiths, you write a book called What Emotions Really Are. That's going beyond science. That's making a philosophical claim. Right? That is saying that's, that's reductionism as a philosophy then. You're saying that somehow if I could give you a complete description of the neurological states, I wouldn't need to talk in the emotional language anymore. That's all there really is, is those neurological states. Now, that's a philosophical position and one that is at least extremely contentious and problematic. And similarly, you don't critique the modern worldview of personhood. And that's why Descartes and his dualism is such a good illustration. That kind of started off the whole problems that have been the, you know, centuries of modern moral philosophy have been trying to solve, basically, things like the mind-body problem and so forth, and the free will problem. They all get going because you have this divide between the mechanistic body and the mind, whatever that is. 
And the idea that the person as an individual somehow split off from the rest of the world, an ego, and this notion of preferences and values. Now, I put that in in particular because you don't find that term, preferences and values, in Descartes. You do find it in all of the evidence-based medicine literature, for example, that talks about individual getting... And I think someone in the talk before used preferences and values. Or I think, yeah, it's something which you find all the time. You never, you really rarely hear anyone explain what the difference is between preferences and values. Why do we need to say this, say two terms here? What do, what do they mean? Is there any difference? No one ever explains it because basically it's about preferences. People think at the end. Now that now that's something which you know, there's a certain philosophical background there which remains unchallenged by this view of person-centered care, which is why it can be presented as so-called uncontroversial because it's not requiring us to challenge any of our fundamental assumptions. But hey, could we be at a point in history when, to make further progress, we actually need to challenge some of our underlying assumptions? Maybe. In which case, we perhaps need a different conception of person-centered practice. One that critiques this notion of scientific reductionism, certainly. So I'll just go through very quickly, but again, you know, people can come back and criticize me if they, they think I'm, you know, whatever, I'm saying something too dogmatic or whatever. But basically, Timon's notion of scientific reductionism, which I've read, he talks about the machine metaphor. And I like that, you know, basically thinking of ourselves as machines. Now, certainly I know, a lot of this stuff, I heard a lot of these expressions in school. He, uh, you know, the, he says it's a position, it's a metaphor that underpins physical medicine, psychology and sociology. It's used in all of these areas. And basically... I don't, know if you've ever, I don't know if you've seen from your background, you know, the terminology might be different, but this idea, finding the building blocks of life, the idea that proper science is about finding what we're all made up of in some way. Um, this can, genes, in genetic science, genes provide a person's blueprint. Again, there's a machine metaphor there. Persons have blueprints. And if we understood genetics properly, I can know everything you were going to do in advance. No. I understood your, your, your individual genetic pattern. Psychology as a neurophysiological epiphenomenon. So an epiphenomenon is something that is just simply generated by something else. So neurophysiology, how the brain works, and as I said, like the emotions, the neurophysiology is what the emotions really are. Social behaviour as applied psychology. So you have there, and again, my experience of the education system, certainly in the UK and in America, and I'm sure I, I can't help feeling it's going to be similar. There's always this sort of feeling that if you're a social scientist, it's like you almost got something to be embarrassed about and apologise for. In principle, you know, you're not really a proper scientist. And the further down the chain you go to the building blocks, you're getting to do true science, right? So, you know, sociology explained in terms of psychology, psychology explained in terms of neurophysiology, and then we explain the biological in terms of the chemical and the physical, don't we? Which is why one of the best-selling books of all time, Stephen Hawking's book, right? You know, and where he talks about physics, and he says that if we could get the full theory of physics, we would have what he calls the complete theory of everything. We wouldn't have to say anything else then. And there's there's a wonderful if you read that book, there's a wonderful sort of um, introduction preface by Carl Sagan and Sagan makes these you know if I wanted anything to uh, to illustrate the sort of the influence that I'm talking about Sagan talks about he says the average person doesn't literally doesn't know anything about his real life he thinks he knows where he's going in the morning he'd give you directions he says but he has no understanding or even conception of the atoms and physical and causal processes that constitute the reality of his life he doesn't know anything Sagan says Right? It's extraordinary. Uh, but, you know, basically, the, so the, the scientific reductionism, is it's, it's a very strong position that influences our current thinking. And, of course, that's going to get into, that's what we're educated with. So it's going to get into every discipline that you do, whatever it is. And it's, you know, it's why, for instance, so many social scientists feel that if they can just make their work more quantitative, it'll be more respectable instead of making it more qualitative, because then that's somehow it's still too embarrassing and personally. Now, on this view of then person sense and personalised medicine, it still represents, as time and correctly notes, a, a sort of progress. But when it's framed in this way, it has 
certain features which it's worth drawing attention to. So the idea is that practice is informed on the one hand by science, plus though the thing that's important to add, patient that preferences. Now you talked about this, you used in your, your, your the, the, the autonomous ethics view that you said it's in, in the bioethics discourse. Um, yeah, you bring the science as the practitioner and the patient brings the values their subjective preferences. And so there's a wonderful paper by Mercury and Gaffney uh, in 2020 on the grade system. So again, I don't know if people are familiar with this or not, but it was it grading of recommendations, assessments, development and evaluation. And it's what the EBM movement produced in order to supplement clinical reasoning about you know, knowledge of randomized controlled trials. They didn't want to be seen to be simply giving a crude reduction view, saying somehow you can do every, all medical diagnosis can be based on random, uh, randomized controlled trials. No, it needs something else. And the, the something else was patient values. Right? Now, and how do you get them? Well, there are various ways. You find, you find ways of gathering information about what people would like or say they would like. and. There's a very influential term used in the values-based practice movement, the two feet principle. Now, Bill Fulford and Ed Peel, I actually, this 2014 um, um, collection, I, I edited this collection. Now, Bill and Ed, they wrote very good articles on that. And I don't think they, I certainly, I must stress, I don't, when, when confronted with the implications of this normal science plus view, they wouldn't endorse it. But nonetheless, their work, one of the reasons I think was why it was so influential is because the language that they use so fits with that view that people could see it as immediately instinctively plausible. And so, the, you know, Ed at one point, he made, Ed P makes a point about um, good science standing on the two feet of uh, clinical evidence of the sort you find in EBM and patient values. And he says, one of the things as a clinician that you need to do is supplement your knowledge with your not with an understanding of patient values. So you can see why then, even though Bill and Ed, I think, would di will, wouldn't agree with a lot of the implications of this, and their view of values-based practice is actually a lot more complex. But nonetheless, you can see why it's been a, it's been a, a big idea in this version of person-centered care. Now, the role of artificial intelligence then is fairly straightforward. You supplement clinical evidence with data about patients patient preferences. You find different ways of gathering that data. You get as much as you can, do it as rigorously and scientifically as you can, and then that, that informs you about the patient value side. And you've got the two, the two feet. You've got the two sides there. And of course, in some cases, you can just ask the individual patient. You know, so if you're a practitioner in the room, you can say, what do you want? You know, as you say, now, they might well say, I'd rather you tell me, but nonetheless, you can just ask them. And this is a move away from paternalism. But it goes to what I think Bill would agree is, an, is another extreme that most of us are legitimately worried about. That extreme is what you call consumerism. So again, our excellent Australian colleagues make these points very well, Arnold and co. Um, there are all sorts of ways in which po health policy across the world is becoming more consumerist. And the language of person-centered care can then be appealed to, to help you know, stop being so paternalist to contend the page what's good for them. Let them tell you what's good for them. Now, there are all sorts of intuitive problems with this and things that worry people. And one of the, well, I think Eves Aquino brings it out brilliantly in his paper on big eye surgery. Right? Now, I don't know if you know if this expression, people are familiar with this, big eye surgery. Um, women in particular, women in the Philippines and women in, you know, from Asian backgrounds, but, you know, I know, well, I, I say the Philippines because one of my ex-students, she was actually seriously considered having big eye surgery. Right? Now, basically, what you do is, you go to a surgeon, you ask for a type of cosmetic surgery whereby you have the shape of your eyes changed so they become bigger or rounder so you look more like a European woman. Right? And you pay to get that done. And certainly in my students' case, and some of the people Akina refers to, these women think, A, it will make them more employable. That's one thing she said to me, was it will make me more employable. And B, she, ha she had to admit she felt it would make her better looking. She just looked like a better woman, like how what a woman should look like. So there's a model there. Basically, women should look like white women, basically. <laughs> you know? And Akina says, if this woman comes in, if this version of person said to care, do you really respect her as a person? She comes in and says, 
oh, I'd like to have my inferior face changed into a superior one, please. You say, oh, well, if that's what you want, then. There you go. I'm being person-centred. I care about you. I'll do. I'll, I'll alter the shape of your eyes. And he says, no, no. This woman, a no, relational to the person. She's part of a whole community, right? And you're damaging that whole community by continuing this practice. So what you need to do is, you know, and again, it's you see why policymakers wouldn't particularly like this because it'd be you, the the borders between health and social care need to be blurred. You need to get into the social issues here. You need to challenge the racist and misogynistic assumptions that are driving this demand and indoctrinating women like my ex-student into thinking that they need to change themselves physically. No, we need to change the world so that they don't feel pressured in that way. No, this is you know, this isn't this doesn't need a clinical intervention. This needs a social intervention. So there are broader issues. So the argument is that this form of person-centred care, it might generate real improvement in certain areas, but it doesn't meet the deep challenges that we need to confront uh, if, we're, if we're to have a more credible position that's really going to change the world. I know. Well, well, well. So we start a course to do or tend to. We've got about 15 minutes, I think. Yeah, we've had 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. OK. So my second, so hopefully that's made sense so far, but people can raise questions at the problem with it. But, yeah. Um, so the second conception, the one that Tamman argues for and the one that I that I try to argue for in the book, uh, me and Derek argue for, uh, anti-reductionism. In fact, person-centred healthcare, to be understood properly, so our argument goes, needs to embody a revision of the modern conceptual framework. So we need to bring back ideas that have been basically thrown out, so ideas from um, Hippocrates, right? Now, again, I, although I've been characterised as an enemy of science by certain people for saying this, I don't think those even those people would have the guts to claim that Hippocrates, the founder of medicine, was an enemy an enemy of science. <laughs> but Hippocrates and Aristotle will talk about the need to bring you know to think about the whole person in a certain way, and to revise this. You know, so we need, and you know, certain ideas. At certain points in history, have been thrown out. So, in the other talk I gave to, to Dali's uh, group last week, I talked about the atom, right? Because at the time, at the time of antiquity, it was thought that Aristotle had given such a devastating critique of the atomists that the atom, that the concept of the atom had been abandoned altogether. But by the dawn of the modern era, whoa, you needed to bring back the concept of the atom if intellectual history was to advance. Certain ideas can be thrown out at certain points. But at some points they need to be brought back in again. You've got to have some kind of Hegelian notion of intellectual progress. We can set up dichotomies, but then sometimes we need to bring the dichotomy, bring the opposite sides together again. So the argument is that we need a re examination of science and value. And we need to ask certain underlying philosophical questions epistemological concerning our knowledge and ontological concerning what we are and what we think people are and what we think patients are and epistemological what we mean about um practice basically and clinical knowledge so purpose one of the arguments that we give is that purpose needs to be seen as an ineliminable aspect of nature now, I say this is an insight that is there in the work of Hippocrates. It's there in Aristotle. I would say it's not been entirely forgotten. It can't be because at some sense, every practitioner has needed to have some notion of what was actually good for someone and what they're supposed to do. And, you know, whether you're dealing with humans or indeed if you're a veterinary scientist, you have to have some notion of, yeah, OK, but what should this animal, what's this animal supposed to be doing? You have to have some notion that there's something to, have, to, to live to the full as a certain kind of being. So it's not been entirely forgotten, but it's definitely been sidelined in all the literature on the modern era. And, and of course, certain philosophical theories of medicine have tried to find theories that completely took it out altogether and said things like, you know, health is just the absence of, you know, the famous biostatistical theory, health is just the absence of disease. And, you know, this notion that, well, you say, well, what does it mean to be, you know, how do you identify disease then? What's the difference between a physical state that is and isn't a disease? If you if you can't use your concept of health to help you understand that, you know you seem to have just got the you know, the cart like the cart in front of the horse. Um, so the wonderful phrase by Stephen Timon that we use: putting the organic horse back 
in front of the mechanical cart. It's this idea that, you know, so the, the, again, the, my apologies, I don't know this, you know, the, in, in, in English, there's a well-known expression about putting the horse in front of the cart. You know, the, you, know, the, you put the cart in front of the horse instead because you made a mistake, right? And it, so basically he says that we need to put the organic horse back in front of the mechanical cart. We need to see organisms as something other than mechanisms. And we need to understand, it's not because we need to, we shouldn't think about biological mechanisms. Oh, yes, we should. But to understand the purpose and the value of mechanical understanding in science, you need to see its contribution to the broad notion of human health and promoting the health of the whole organism. And that's actually, there's all sorts of ways in which then you can truly understand the value of certain interventions, including certain kinds of technological interventions. So what's the distinction then? Organisms as opposed to mechanisms. What's the difference between them? Well, Tyman has a number of features which I, I would endorse. Organisms are seen to be essentially whole at all stages of development, as opposed to being whole at a critical stage of assembly. So you think if you're building your machine, whether it's your little AI device or whether it's, whether it's a computer or whether it's your television or whatever it is, there's a certain point at which it starts to perform the functions that you want it to form. And you can't, we can't understand its function on its own as if it's an independent being. It isn't. The functions are programmed into it by the designers. And at some point, you put it together and you say, right, OK, it's now working. And then it become, then you can think of it as a whole thing. Until then, it's just a, 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 a collection of random parts. Now, whereas an organism, as Tyman argues, is essentially whole at all stages of its development, even from the very simplistic stage, and it develops and grows and it moves through the world. It's always in transition in response to an ever-changing environment. Now, he uses a quote which comes from Heidegger. Heidegger says at one point we should have, we should stop thinking of organs as having capacities and instead think of capacities as having organs. Now again, it's a sort of, it's an annoying Heidegger way of putting it, okay, but the basic idea there makes a lot of sense. The point is, in terms of ontology, what the organ really is, you have to understand that capacities are properties, aspects of a whole being. And that to understand what the organ is, you will need to understand the role it plays in enabling that whole being to fulfill certain of its capacities. That's what the organ is. You don't understand what it is until you understand what it does as its function in that whole being, what that whole being does, right? And otherwise you commit what is called the mere logical fallacy. You ascribe a property to a part of a thing that is, in fact, a property of the whole thing. The whole organism moving its way through the world has its capabilities. So, um, you know, when one organ is damaged, sometimes you can find another organ to fulfill the function. The function, the activity, is a the whole thing. So, what's it? And even with certain technological things, I mean, I mean, what was the what, the one recently? A colleague. A colleague of mine, he had something done to his eye with technology. He couldn't see for a while. Like, and they did something. And the technology has basically replaced certain of the things that his eye and the associated physiological mechanisms used to do. He can see again. It's an amazing advance in technology, to my mind, what they've, do what they've done there. But the point is, it's not like the seeing isn't a feature of the eye per se. He, the whole being, sees the world. And he's now seeing it in a different way. And you can't actually understand how wonderful that technology is until you understand that basic holistic point, right? And, you know, things like, you know, and obviously things like, you know, sign language, you know, when you lose the ability to speak or to hear in certain ways, but you can, you learn to, you learn to use your hands and you do it differently. Those are things, you know, the wonderful stuff that foot and mouth artists do rather than painting, you know, painting isn't necessarily a property of the hand, is it? You know, there's all sorts of human activities where they're active, active to the whole being, and they're normally performed by certain organs, but you can replace them with other parts in principle. And so you need to understand the whole being as a thing moving through the world and what time calls a complex adaptive system, dispositional elements performing in context. Right? So there are dispositions to do certain things and you move through the world, and that's what the organism is. You can't break it down into its biological bit and its person bit. You need to think of the whole thing, and then you can understand those aspects of it 
better as part of their role within a whole process. So he talks about the person as a unique set of experiences together with a narrative that interprets or gives meaning. And we, I wouldn't go into detail on that now because I'd be running out of time. Um, but basically, that notion embodies both the ideas of complexity and uniqueness, right? Because you are a particularly unique process. And so there's a wonderful statement in Aristotle about this. When, I, when I'm moving along the road, he says, there's a certain sense in which me and the road are identical at that point. Right, because a full description of what I am involves reference to the road, this other thing, and a full description of the road involves reference to me. And my journey can, will be unique. It's my particular journey, but and it's very complex. But I am a process, so that's why things like Whitehead and process philosophy can be relevant to to this as well. And basically, you need to focus on the whole person, its essence as its internal and external relations. And the argument is that this is the form of person-centered care that w many we would argue gives us a way to really make a fundamental change to how we think about healthcare. And you understand the value of all interventions in that context, and that includes AI. So get back to the chat boss and the human practitioner. Once you understand this, you know, the point, the, the point that you were making about what was wrong with the, 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 the simpler system, about preferences and so forth, it seems to me you can understand that and why that version of AI doesn't work why you need to have a human practitioner in, but nonetheless, AI can have a role if it, in, and other types of technology in facilitating, as I said, this whole process, this holistic process, it can have an incredibly important usage. So that's why it seemed to me consideration of the uses and limits of AI can help clarify the nature of person-centered healthcare. And similarly, it seems to me person-centered healthcare can help us think contextualize the debate about artificial intelligence. So I'm trying to sort of say a lot of things there. I hope that makes sense. I mean, I think there's a debate, it's ongoing. I'm not giving you a final solution here, but what I'm trying to do is say, you know, we probably need a conceptual shift and we need to listen to each other coming from certain different debates. We need to talk to each other in order to see where we go next, because there is, we could be at quite an important stage in intellectual history. And let's try and play our part in this and maybe move this debate forward. And, you know, this isn't being anti-science at all. This is actually saying, hey, we can see science as helping us with a broader notion of human reasoning, which involves moral reasoning, involves certain other types of intellectual and social capacities, and can hopefully help us assist people in living better for our lives. So I, I don't know, hopefully that makes sense, but see what people think. Thank you. Right. Thank Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michael, uh, for the votes. That is one hour, so perfect. And now we have time for questions, uh, comments. Uh, I think we have two already. Marco and Elka. I don't know who goes first. Oh. Yeah, that is, please. Okay. It's first. <laughs> Such a gentleman. That's why you love him. Right. <laughs> uh, Michael, thank you for your talk. It was wonderful to hear, and I have all sorts of questions in my head. And I agree with you, but I want to uh, hear, uh, I mean, I want to uh, understand more, because you think we lose a lot uh, if we turn to AI because it's too objective, it's going to be too objective, right? And AI could be objective wrong in many mm -hmm. cases because we lose uh, the complexity of human choices, right? Well, uh, human decision making. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. And I agree that uh, in a sense of medical assistance, we do have a lot of complex um, cases, such as you said, our donation for assisted suicide and many complex. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree with you that these complex situations need a lot more than just objective answers. They need a full broad concept of social and psychological mm -hmm. and everything that maybe an EA, uh, artificial intelligence couldn't do yet. But what about the simple cases? And let's say you go to the doctor because you have a flu. Mm. I understand that you have a life history, you have issues, but you just want to solve the flu you have. 
Yes. So you're not going to need okay. a lot of uh, background to that. You want to go and grab a uh, medicine and take that medicine and go back home and work on your problems of your own, yeah. right? Uh, couldn't EA do that? Uh, uh, do you really need a doctor for simple cases? Yeah. That's well. That's it. No, but what, I mean, what I wasn't trying to do was say that uh, we should rule out artificial intelligence from practice, from healthcare practice any more than you know, pointing out the limits of scientific reasoning is actually being anti-science. Or saying we should we should rule out science. But no, we shouldn't. Definitely mm -hmm. not. And similarly, with artificial intelligence, it can have its proper uses so long as we have to understand that it needs to be framed. What we can't do is just hand over decisions. So we're going to take out the human bias now and hand it over to the machine because as we see the, the machine is in fact a human product and it can incorporate implicitly the same biases that the humans had you know, and so you need you can't do without that critical reflection on your underlying assumptions but it doesn't from what you said you, you're making your what you're outlining there is a decision that in this particular case it could make sense to use ai mm -hmm. and yet we could we could just we could probably justify that decision yes once you'd explain what the, the limitations were so well in this case this isn't going to be a problem this could actually help that's right yeah then it has a legitimate use Mm -hmm. So what I'm not doing is trying to say that I'm not being one, as I said, one of these sort of anti-tech people and saying, no, we should wipe it out. It should never be used. Let's go back to plowing the fields. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> we can use the technology, but we need to keep our humanity in terms of our critical perspective and, 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 and keep our notion of fallibility and realize that the, the systems that we invent are themselves are not infallible either. But my question is, if in that simple cases, yes. not the complex one, mm. can you rule out the position and mm. turn just to AI? Right. If you, you'd have to give me a description. Yeah. So you're saying that there'd be some the in the, the same clue. way that. Yeah. Okay. okay. So what you say, if, if you, if you, so I think in the same way that probably not entirely, but you could have, I mean, it's like, you know, the way, and again, we you look at the economic, you know, you can you take a Marxian view of certain things. When you look at, um, I don't know what it's like here, but certainly in Britain, in supermarkets now, you're lucky to find two employees in total who will be in certain supermarkets because everyone checks out by the mechanical checkout. But you still need to have some real people around in order to come because the machines don't work or certain people use them wrongly or all sorts of things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. But you minimise the number of people. And we know the reason why employers are doing that, they're using the technology to dismiss their staff, basically, to, to reduce the numbers of actual people employed. And so there are all sorts of issues that that raises, but in principle, it's possible. And it seems to me, in the kind of cases you're talking about, you you, know, you could th you could presumably have systems where a lot of this could be allocated mm -hmm. to the AI system. But I think you would still need to have some people there saying you know, that, that would be the fallback. So when particular patients have problems or issues with the system or whatever, you know, yeah, you would you would still need to. Okay, thank you, Bianca, uh, Marco, and then Marcelo. Marco, please. Uh, okay, let me put it on. Uh, Michael, thank you, Ian. Uh, let me say that, uh, yes, I, I said that I didn't read the, the, the last book, but I've read several things of uh, written by Michael, not by Mitchell, but by Michael. For example, uh, uh, your main book, before that is the man, uh, the criticism of managerialism and, and yeah. myth and mythology, etc. I don't remember the the, the ethics the, management of mythology is the one we think. Yeah, about that, yeah. And this is a very interesting book, uh, and uh, I, I have this as a PDF that I found in the internet. I know, or, or, not, I, or, or not sure. I think you you give it to me. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you give it to me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. But I can I can. I can send to them. Can get that for free now because it's almost at academia yeah. edu. So yeah, just download it. <laughs> because it's, uh, when I remember your that book, I uh, I see Michael as a kind of Socratic uh, philosopher. He usually uh, uh, makes several criticisms in this in the uh, with the aim I think uh, that the the reader think about. Uh, mm. about uh, her or his presuppositions or prejudices and uh, and uh, and put in a position of criticism uh, criticism of and uh, and the, the book is very critical to, mm. to, to the 
to the to the management, the use of, for example, KLI uh, as a measure, etc. And uh, uh, so I, I I know several things you wrote that are critical in this sense, in a Socratic sense, and others are more positive. For example, your discussions about. Uh, 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 let me say that that discussion with the uh, Finnish or the people from uh, I know I don't know if they are uh, Swedish or uh, uh, about the triage in uh, uh, that, is it Norwegians you think yeah are what? Norwegian colleagues Re Norwegian, Norwegian. Yes, yeah, yeah. The, the baby uh, so so uh, uh, I think you have. Uh, one part of your presentation is this, uh, is a uh, criticism or reflection on our presuppositions. And the last part, I'm waiting for that, is uh, the positive uh, argument for one view of uh, person-centered healthcare. Mm -hmm. So when you presented the two uh, versions, uh, in the beginning, I didn't know already what you uh, uh, you will uh, support or or uh, what what you claim. But now, in the in in the end, I I know that you are suggesting this. I understood uh, for uh, the anti-reductionist approach mm. that and uh, and this uh, vision that needs uh, to revise. Or modern conceptual framework to re-examinate uh, science and value, the distinction, uh, the separation, maybe, uh, etc. So, uh, so let me make a, a comment. Uh, I think your approach is very interesting, but uh, I remember uh, uh, a word that Peter Strawson used in individuals that uh, he called his approach on metaphysics. A descriptivist, and he says that there are several approaches in metaphysics that are revisionist. Mm. And I think your approach or suggestion to medicine and to person centered healthcare is a kind of revisionist uh, approach because uh, it needs several changes in the practice of healthcare and medicine to be actual. And and so um, uh, maybe my position is a kind of uh, uh, rep, uh, 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 when I was younger, we uh, separate the reformists to the revolutionaries. You were you were suggesting a kind of revolutionary approach. I'm a kind of reformist, more modest. Uh, 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 and let me say why. Uh, uh, for example. There is one approach that I seen that I think that is similar to yours. That is the Canadians, the Canadian approach. They call the patient center, uh, uh, but it's not a patient center approach. Uh, it is uh, 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 the late mentioned this: the patient center medicine transforming the clinical method of more Stewart and others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I don't know if Michael is suggesting something sim similar, but they, they, they argue for uh, one view that what is missing in clinical practice is the fact that doctors like such as me are not in the real practice, uh, 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 let me say, uh, pay the uh, right or correct attention to the subjective aspects of people, of yeah. patients. Yeah. So uh, they suggest another method, including in uh, the, the uh, another method for semiology. I'm, I teach semiology. I, I, I teach semiology to my students in uh, here in in the university, uh, in the uh, medicine uh, faculty, and so they suggest a complete revolutionary method of semiology. Uh, they say that since physicians don't pay the proper attention to the subjective aspects of people, uh, when the physician is uh, in a medical encounter, is asking to the patients, what are you what are you here? What are your symptoms? What are you feeling? Uh, and the patient says, oh, I have a 
for example, a stomach ache that began uh, yesterday in the morning, and uh, it's 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 like this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this description, uh, they 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 think that the physician should pay attention to the feeling, to the internal aspect of, the, and so they suggest a complete uh, different description, not only the method of the uh, propedeutic, but a complete description of the clinical exam. And I say, uh, 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 Michael, I have more than 40 years of medicine since I am uh, a student. And I, and I think, and I'm saying, I'm a very good doctor, very good doctor. And I don't use this method. Don't use this method. I think this is completely bullshit. And what's uh, this doesn't works. It doesn't work. Uh, 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 so I think that in the what you need to a person-centered, a true person-centered approach is not this. This is not what is missing in the clinical practice. This is not what is missing. What is missing is completely different. It's it, it's to, it, it's it's patients that see the. Uh, uh, let me. I ha I have to 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 offer example to understand that. For example, uh, today. Uh, in the morning, I I I, I saw uh, a patient that is a demented uh, in, uh, woman uh, with uh, 90 years old, uh, we, uh, 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 that uh, that was uh, with fever, coughing. Uh, uh, he's in bad. She's in bed, and I I went to 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 her home. Actually, I I didn't talk it to with her. I talked it with the 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 daughter and so uh, what I uh, what I did I asked them for the exactly the traditional method of semiology in medicine I asked for the beginning of the symptoms uh, when the when did it began uh, what happened what exams they uh, uh, she did before because she she did some something before a, 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 a doctor went in the beginning of the week and so after I began to exam, make the exam, and I and I and I make the exam, the traditional exam, the traditional exam. I I, I saw the patient, the color of the skin, uh, the mouth, the ear, uh, the uh, the breast. I make auscultation and I use a technology that is focus, ultrasonography. I take my uh, son, my my echography equipment and put in her, and this is very interesting in the method of uh, to use a technology to make a really that I think a really person centered method. That is, the 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 daughter the daughter was in my sight, seeing what I uh, what I'm doing, and I was explaining to her what I'm seeing and explaining what I'm thinking about. In the in in the beginning, I, 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 uh, so but but it is completely traditional. The the method is traditional. So so the difference is that I'm in relationship with the person and explaining to her what I'm seeing. See, I, I, so see, I'm seeing what is it. Uh, I, I'm see this, I, and I'm explaining technically. Technically, uh, this is the pleura, and this is the pleura, and and and, and above this, this is. Only an artifact. Don't do that. But this, this, this is a pneumonia. Pneumonia. I diagnose in the morning. COVID. Uh, uh, okay. She she was with COVID. I I I I did an exam. COVID positive. Actually, I did. I I saw the image, and I saw the pneumonia, and she was taking a medication. I say this is correct. And after what, what, what I, when I say this, what is personalized here? Personalized the relationship with the persons. It's not the method of obtaining data or data. It's not in the method. Uh, uh, the the steward more uh, say that the clinical reasoning should be transformed. No, no, the clinical reasons should not do not need. It, it, we don't need to transform the clinical the, the the clinical method. We have to transform the relationship. No, the practice of it. Yeah, I, 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 what's puzzling? So th this is my uh, my criticism. Yeah. This is what I I, I see is uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, but but for for concluding, uh, no one 
in in the universe <laughs> do the clinic the clinical method of the Canadians. It's it's completely useless. What have you done? Whatever you say about the clinical methods of the Canadians, how that is a response to what I actually said is, to say the least, unclear. You even give the example of a dementia case. Right? Now, you, you know Kit Woodsworth, one of the really important people who's established the thinking about person-centered care. Kit Wood's background is dementia care. Right? And the whole point that Kit Wood is making is that you know, this model, which I've been explaining why we need to move on from it, because one of the assumptions, one of its direct implications, if you apply this modern view very consistently, is you get a consumerist view. And it makes no goddamn sense how you apply that in the case of people with dementia, for instance, unless you have a social relational concept of the person, right? And you have to own up and admit that that is your philosophy, right? Unless you have that, and then you are challenging that modern worldview, right? Unless you have that, you can't begin to talk sensibly about what it means to take a person-centered approach to dementia care. And I think Kit would have established that point very clearly indeed. But you know, And you talk about dealing with the members of the family and dealing with their community role and so forth. Now, your problems with a particular Canadian model of diagnosis don't yeah. in any way touch on that underlying philosophical question. And the underlying philosophical question was that so sometimes the practical debates we're having, we can't just bounce them off. And this is why some of the debates we have that you read fed of my stuff about bioethics, where people try artificially, for instance, to get rational answers to certain rationing discussions by sealing off the broader political context and saying, well, this is your right. Yeah. No, I agree. Right. Yeah. Sometimes you can't do that and have an honest answer. And that's the point we're making. And one of the things of all the general propositions there are, I think, can we understand this? The idea that intellectual history ended at just the point when we rolled up on the scene is an overwhelmingly implausible statement. Right? Intellectual history may need to make progress. There were same ways. If you look at people, you know, the sort of, you know, in the sort of twelfth century, for instance, there were all sorts of problems that they had that they couldn't solve because they lacked the right conceptual framework. History needed to move on and develop in all sorts of ways. And I would say that where we are now, we can't just assume that that's not the case. You know, as a fan of Star Trek, you might well appreciate that, right? There could be some time in the future when people can look back, like Doctor, you mentioned Dr. McCoy, and say, oh, my God, what are they doing, these barbarians? You know? <laughs> and because from his perspective, he could see now how... As a, as a medic, he could do things so much better than people in the 21st century were doing. But, of course, they were doing their best at the time, but, the, you know, in some ways, history had to move on. Now, your problem with the specific method which you're throwing at me there doesn't really undermine that broad point that I'm making, that what that some t the person-centred care, we can put it in a way that is compatible with our underlying assumptions, and that way we can make we can sell it to certain people and make it sound non-challenging. But there are particular problems it will give rise to, and that's it. The issue that so I gave you, the, I, I threw out that example of consumers, and others the one to throw out. If you take that framework unrevised, you get that notion of person-centeredness, which is going to have it's going to bring some progress, but it's also going to be severely limited in certain cases. It's not going to explain how you do person-centered care for people with dementia for a start, right? Yeah. But it's not it's it's going to give you the problems that I raised when discussing a keno uh, and the big eye surgery things. There are all sorts of limitations to it, which is why if we can't say it in an academic context, where the hell can we say it? At some point we need a conceptual revision. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Marco. Uh, okay, Marcelo, please. Uh, yeah, I'm. Could you open the microphone and make your question? Thank you. Thank you, Dale. C can you hear me well? Yeah. Very good. Th thank you. Yes, Michael. yes, yes. I have to switch off my microphone, otherwise the the problems. But yes, we we are. Hearing you well. Thank you, Dale. Uh, and thank you, Michael. I, I did enjoy your talk. Uh, you addressed many fascinating topics. And uh, then I've been trying to connect some of them uh, together and trying to understand how they hang together. Um, one particular point you have addressed is the one about biases and AI and you return to this topic at different moments of your talk. But right at the beginning of a talk, you mentioned AI in conjunction 
uh, noise, I think twice did you use uh, this kind of conjunction, noise and AI, uh, sorry, uh, uh, noise and bias. And I was just wondering how you connect or how you see the, the, the role that um, noise might play in the context of your talk. Of course, AI uh, systems at large, and AI is just a kind of system, can contain bias. Uh, if different, for example, if different judges or different doctors have uh, are biased, they tend to have the same kind of opinion about one and the same case. They are quite consistent mm -hmm. with, with one another, but they are biased. And it's well known now that AI systems can be very, very biased. And there's been a lot of discussion as to how to de-biased mm. the training data. Uh, but it seems that there has been uh, less attention uh, given to the problem of noise. Uh, systems can also have a lot of noise when medical a medical system or the legal system for example when they have very different opinions about one of the same case uh, mm -hmm. this is a case of noise noise is more about the variability variability uh, rather than consistency uh, but both uh, noise and bias are there are not welcome in systems, legal system, medical system, and so on. Well, uh, it seems that while uh, AI can be very prone to biased, it's there be, there's been some discussion now as to the capacity uh, 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 that AI systems have to avoid noise. E e while you can still have bias, uh, it seems that AI systems are very uh, are far less prone to noise, right. and that might be a virtue uh, of uh, of a, a of of uh, the use of AI systems in the medicine. For I think one uh, common experience many people have had about the illnesses is that they have different opinions about their own cases. Uh, they can't decide. So, but if if there are many different opinions, it means that the opinions are not biased. They are just just noise in the system, and of course, you you want to have the the, the right kind of of opinion. You want mm. to have you want to have the noise removed from the medical system. And the only point I'm trying to drive at is that it might not be a good idea bias and noise on a par, as you made at the oh, beginning of your talk, okay. because noise is, a quite, noise is a quite different phenomenon. And as I said, it seems that AI systems are very good at avoiding noise while allowing bias. So, uh -huh. okay. I mean, yeah, I get, I take the point you're making. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, really, I was just agreeing with Marco and with the stuff that you know he sent around at the beginning of the you know the, the prep for this talk about you know that there was this there was this argument that they could remove cognitive biases or noise that was that was a quote that I took from that material that Marco had circulated and I was just trying to sort of say you know and that what the point he was making though was that that was theoretically the case but he wasn't saying that in fact it can do it and he was bringing out all these reasons why it can be very difficult well i think you make an interesting point that distinction between bias and noise i i hadn't really picked up on that and i think that's something you know that's something that yeah you know, i don't necessarily want to rebut you on that you know i i, I think that's something i need to learn a bit more about actually thank you uh, thank you for yeah, there is a recent book by the this author uh, Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman. They, oh, he, yeah, he yeah. made the uh, he, he contributed to the to, to this publicity to the concept of bias. But more recently, I think last year or two years, remember, he published a new book along with two further authors about noise. And his take now is that uh, noise is far more problematic than bias, and he he focuses on legal systems. But this is one of his points that uh, AI systems are less prone to to noise 
uh, than to buy it. Thank you. <laughs> At which point we bring in the noise to block to blank, block you out. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Marcelo, very much. It was funny, we got some noise here around the room. <laughs> There's an airplane. Yeah, ah, okay. Ah, it was there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, that's okay. Okay. Anyone else have questions? Or, no? We still have some time. Michael, maybe I can say something also. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I have a, a comment and, and I would like to press you uh, on, on two questions, let's say again, mm -hmm. because I think that uh, we could, uh, in, in the spirit that you uh, brought this your talk, we, you should uh, talk more about uh, the kind of version that we would like to develop. So I agree that uh, uh, it, it, it's not the time just to stop theorizing and practicing, yeah. but we need to go back to some some com, uh, concepts. So my, my first, it's, it's just a comment, okay? I, I agree with you that um, AI, uh, we should not be pro nor against, and uh, that is some. There are some tensions mm -hmm. with the uh, a person-centered medicine. Yeah. But uh, there is a way to accommodate and to have the benefits to try to avoid mm -hmm. the uh, the problems and so on. So there are potential conflicts, but uh, we should not be against. So I agree on that point. But I have two questions. Uh, let's say one is uh, on the concept of person, and I think that one kind of. Uh, uh, disagreement about the uh, what Marco said and you said is that we don't have it let's say to, uh, talking much about uh, the concept of person mm -hmm. okay because if if you go back to your last uh, slide you said that a person it's a has a set of experience uh, and that a narrative uh, context gives some kind of meaning and so on mm -hmm. And uh, I think I have some troubles with, with this concept of person. I think that for me, for instance, a person it's it's much more a kind of moral and juridical entity than than a, a kind of a set of experience of or, or has a unique subjectivity and so on. That's why I think that Mark was complaining about uh, this. Uh, not not just to pay attention to the disease or the illness, but also to the, the kind of experience that people yeah. have. So my question is this, uh, if we analyze the concept of person, I think one necessary condition is agency. And another one is to see as a kind of moral entity. Uh, so in, in my view, a person is a bearer of rights and or obligations. And I don't see in your conception of person or personhood, mm -hmm. this idea that uh, to have a right is a necessary condition, even to be an agent. Because if you deny a person uh, freedom, for instance, liberties and so on, you, you cannot act. Uh, you cannot be, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, someone who is responsible for for something. Mm. Um, I think that this goes, uh, let's say, it, it's, it's not a criticism, but, me, but the question is, what kind of uh, uh, function or role you see um, for the person, really? Because I think, to 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 context the kind of objection that you gave to the kind of uh, provocation that Marco did the, the dimension case, I could say that a, a, a patient could lose agency, but never uh, the right, for instance, to be respected. Yeah. So uh, respect for persons, for instance, is very very important. And as I understand the Canadian yeah. version, let's say. It's person-centered because first, you decentralize the illness or the, 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 
the disease and you see the holy person, I think you yeah. agree about that point, but then also you decentralize the, the doctor <laughs> side and you have a kind of equal relationship between two persons. And this is a moral, this is a moral notion that e but you, you have the equality between persons, okay? So please tell us more about your conception of person and whether you allowed for this kind of reason that persons e have rights and so on. I mean, it, it, equal in what sense? It's like you said, I was struggling to stand with Marco. It seems to feel there was, a, there was a, a clear disagreement. And I couldn't actually see how much of what he was actually advocating was incompatible with anything that I said, because I was making points of a very fundamental nature about the need to, for us to think more and to have more exchange on certain conceptual revisions. Now, it seems to me I've got my own position on values and ethics, and you'd, you know, which I could say more about. But the point is, in terms of the notion of agency. I mean, I've argued elsewhere for you know, a, 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 quite a strong moral realist position that seems to me that in terms of, you know, when I'm arguing with philosophers, in terms of epistemology and ethics, because in philosophy you have a certain, there's a certain traditional way of viewing, as you, as you know, you know, sort of you know, the, the really important philosophical subjects, let's face it, you know, as if you go to set, certainly certain British universities, you know, um, epistemology is probably key, well, logic, epistemology, and then, you know, Things like ontology. So long as we're not, we don't play around with this continental stuff, then we can talk about ontology. So long as we mean so what is there, something. Like and then ethics is the stuff that you do if you're not quite as good. Uh, and then meta ethics, you know, uh, this sort of thing. Now, it seems to me we need a fundamental revision of how we do philosophy as well. We need to understand that knowing the world is something that we do, and it's something that we do as within a social context. I get to know the world because I grow up in a certain way and I get certain types of assistance from others and I'm educated in certain respects. And so the whole social ethical thing is actually far more fundamental to our understanding. You know, epistemology is then is understood as part of that of that process, it's something that we do. Now I could go into I could try and give a more, you know, a more detailed account, but I think what we, you know, the fundamental thing that we're agreeing on there, when you say a person is a moral entity, what you seem to mean by that is simply that there is certain, you know, the be someone who doesn't see why, someone who, someone who was willing to entertain the possibility that maybe, you know, okay, a person with dementia doesn't have autonomy according to certain standard definitions of autonomy. You know, ask them, ask them to do the Kant, the sort of reasoning that Kant says is central to being a moral agent. And guess what? They can't do it, can't they? You know? And so, therefore, they're not persons. Someone who, who would take that possibility seriously and wouldn't see if you, you know, once you've gone that far theorizing, oops, when we get to that conclusion, our theorizing must have gone wrong somewhere. So this is why I have what I would call a certain type of Aristotelian or intuitionist position. There are certain things, you know, people are dancing with particularism. And I think what he does with the term particularism is interesting. Basically, he's taking an Aristotelian virtue ethics approach, yeah. but putting a different slant on it. And it seems to me, yeah, I would have to admit my position is an Aristotelian virtue-based approach. And I'm trying to say that all this, you know, me learning how to develop, in terms of my moral education, I'm try trying to develop the right set of dispositions to enable me to act appropriately when I'm interacting with my fellow human beings. And indeed with the broader world, with, with animals and with you know, the environment. Thus, um, that's foundational to ethics. There's a lot I could say on that, but I'm not kind of disagreeing with you fundamentally about, you know, that personhood is a moral concept. Yes, I think it is. Yeah. We, that's to say, you know, when we understand, you know, if you really you know, understand someone's a person, there's certain ways in which you should, you should and shouldn't treat them. But also, it seems to me that we have to develop sufficiently strong intuitions so that we're going to reject certain technical definitions of personhood precisely because they would rule out certain of our fellow beings for being persons and maybe so so so, so things that are, a, a definition of personal that suggests that anyone who's a person should also be capable of being a, a moral agent in the sense that they should make all manner of rational decisions we have to say no we can't take that definition of a person because that's going to mean that this <laughs> this individual over here who's, who's clearly no longer in a position to make any of those decisions isn't a person anymore, and so they should be marginalised in terms of healthcare. So, 
No, no, not what we mean by person-centeredness. Let's rule that one out. So it seems to me, I mean, I could say more about my position, but what I'm not trying to do here is kind of lay down the law and say, here's the detail of my position and you should follow that. I'm trying to say why we need to have that kind of fundamental debate. That's simple, isn't it? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, the second point is is maybe related to, to your... Aristotelian background. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that Aristotle cannot help. I believe yeah. so. But um, uh, I think that this point, um, it, it's also related to the kind of uh, proposal that you have. It's not a simplistic, uh, let's say, uh, view about the uh, personal center uh, medicine, but it's more like fundamental, essential, and so on. Mm -hmm. And you, you had the uh, this criticism about the modern view, I, I think in general I agree that there is this uh, reductionist approach to to nature, and, and you should take, let's say, a more methodological approach, mm. not not a metaphysical one. I agree, that's okay, and also that uh, there is this uh, individualistic uh, uh, political philosophy that that is there. Mm. So I agree with your your criticism, but I'm a little bit less uh, less uh, uh, capable of following the, the idea that uh, purpose is is a, a, a kind of uh, aspect of nature mm. that we should take seriously. Uh, so my, my question is is about this uh, teleological element because i can agree for instance with uh, pellegrino when when he says that uh, for the patient's good good is the kind of uh, the health is a kind of telos mm. and uh, the, the the good of the patient for instance has four elements you know that you probably yeah. that yeah. there is a, a, the sense that the person gives to the, the ultimate meaning of life for for her for the patient yeah. let's say but to say that there is one it's it's oh, really yeah. a problem and yeah. do you remember the other the other elements ingredients it's the personhood and so on the, the, the biomedical thing and so on so if if you say that, that we should find some purpose in in nature uh, do you mean this uh, kind of metaphysical? In the, well, okay. Yeah, in the nature. In the, no, the notion of teleology, I'm saying we can't, we've had a systematic idea that it needs to be reduced to uh, to something else, basically, to something more mechanistic. And what I'm saying is, ultimately, I don't think we can understand organisms in that way. That how something ought to, you know, now that's not to say saying there's one purpose, but you know, what's the anecdote about Aristotle, some poor kid, thrown some poor kid out the academy supposedly because the kid the, 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 he said how do we know what the purpose what was it now the, the purpose of was the function of the goats with some feature you know and this person suggested a, a very advanced thinker for his time suggested a kind of modern evidence-based type of approach well let's go and look at how it actually functions in most goats mm -hmm. right and then we'll then we can get a model as to what the the norm is and they Aristotle was like, get out of this academy. Right? <laughs> Most goats could be ill. Mm -hmm. right? Now, of course, Aristotle, I think, well, I think that sounds incredibly harsh if he threw this, this young person out for that. Nonetheless, Aristotle does have a point, and it's all the things that we've had in terms of the debate that we've had about the biostatistical model over the last sort of 50 years. You know, this you know, you can't, you know, if you if you apply this notion of normality, A is people like Elston King have made wonderfully, you know, but all sorts of people have written on this, you know, you're you, you have to select the type of being that you're talking about in a certain way. The the facts don't just tell you what kind of being to select. So you have to look what's the norm for that in that type. But your selection of type is also is always going to have some kind of value laden component to it. And we all know the the simplistic, you know, the problems which Christopher Bors himself did try to at least respond to, given his due, but I don't think he responded in a very effective way. Yeah. Yeah, that is, you know, a simple view of the biostatistical model explains why. You know, I'm sure Governor Ron DeSantis will be happy to use that model very soon, especially if he becomes president, uh, and will be saying, yeah, most guys are attracted to women. They are not attracted to men. Ergo, the attraction to woman 
is part of good health. A guy attracts another guy is sick, and he does indeed need to have all sorts of, you know, let's give him some electric shock therapy or something. And the point is, what we actually had is an evaluative debate, and quite rightly said, no, but there's nothing harmful to people in being attracted to same sex. And in so far as we have a, a debate about this issue, it's going to be inherently about the values involved and what is good and bad. What you know, it, it, you can't edit that out of it. And 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 make it purely empirical on you know look at what's normal in a certain notion of the bi you know the biological norm because that's you know there were some norms that you know and as as you know and Tim Thornton you know, you know, Tim Thornton's wonderful example of high intelligence that you would have to try and find ways just as you can try and help people with certain types of learning difficulties to get to more like you know the norm as it were. You would you would have to note that high intelligence was a deviation from the norm, and try to make these people less intelligent. You find some way to do that <laughs> because, you know, because that's if you use the statistical norm. But instead, if you have some notion of how something should be, you know that's what you can't edit out. Basically, that's what I'm saying there. How this should be working is not something that you can edit out if you have an understanding of what organisms are. That's okay. We can finish. Uh, Marco, you'd like to say something to end the Congress? Uh, from, from well, uh, the institutional point of view. Yes, so yes, 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 yes. <laughs> well, uh, I, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you first, Michael, for visiting us. Uh, he came from England. Is the uh, the only one uh, from abroad uh, we couldn't. We could uh, uh, bring about, bring to her, to us, and uh, so thank you because the uh, travel certainly was very uh, tiresome. But uh, uh, and we hope that we can continue to exchange ideas and discuss sometimes with uh, with a more uh, disagreement but maybe with more agreements that we ever can uh, find. And uh, thank you for uh, Darley to help us and to help, in, including to coordinate this last section. And uh, Marcelo is uh, in Rio de Janeiro. This is Marcelo. Uh, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he will meet, uh, uh, meet you, Michael, in Rio. Uh, and and I, I have also to uh, thank to all students uh, from the undergraduation for the graduate program, uh, my students and students of other teachers and uh, people that are uh, at home. So uh, I think you ha we have three uh, uh, very interesting uh, days. Uh, I tried to uh, participate in all of them. Fortunately, fortunately, I couldn't. Uh, but uh, uh, my, my, in my opinion, it was a very successful event. Uh, and so, uh, of uh, uh, and of it, it's uh, of uh, all successful events. We hope that we have more. Uh, con uh, uh, consequence, uh, good consequence, uh, papers and discussions, etc. And so, uh, thank you uh, for all of you, and uh, thank you, Marcel, and thank you uh, all of you again. And we we have this is the twenty sixth uh, colloquium of yeah, philosophy yeah. in Sina, so we we have more uh, uh, more twenty. Uh, I hope we have more 26 in the next years. Thank you very much. Thank you.